Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Watkins, and I'm happy to start us off today. On behalf of the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health, I want to thank each one of you for joining us today. Uh, the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health is one of the 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units, also known as PESUs in the U.S. The purpose of the PESU program is to serve as a leading national source of medical information and consultative advice on environmental conditions that influence human health throughout reproduction production, and pediatric development. The PACUs are here to serve health professionals, community organizations, governmental officials, child care providers, parents, and others who have an interest in environmental health. To serve part of our mission, we will be offering this Pediatric Environmental Health Grand Round Series once a month, being held on the third Thursday of every month. We are grateful that you have joined us today to hear Dr. Chris Wyant discuss exposure to forever chemicals for children at risk. Before moving forward, I want to make you aware of some housekeeping items. During the event, sharing your video is not an option. You will be muted uh, by default upon joining and you cannot unmute yourself. To ask a question or to speak, please type your question to the host of this event using the Q&A panel on the right side of the screen. We would like to thank all of our partners at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Without these organizations, the work of the PACU would not exist. We would also like to thank both the TTU HSCL PASO CME department, specifically Erica Silvis and Jesse Boykin, and the UMC CNE department, uh, specifically Ms. Celia Gonzalez Najera, for making continuing education credits available for the Grand Round series. Each registrant must log in with their registration ID, which will be used to track their login. This will allow us to provide continuing education credits. We ask that if you are requesting credit, you stay on the call for the entire presentation. Um, special note, all registered participants who are seeking CME and CNE credits must request their credits after they have completed the post-test and survey uh, for that presentation by sending an email to Ms. Moraima Baron, host of these grand rounds. Our next Grand Rounds will be Thursday, March 17, 2022, at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. It's on LED, which is presented by Dr. Christina Sobin, who's professor and MPH program director for the University of Texas at El Paso. So you can use the QR code there to register. If you're looking for more info on pediatric environmental health and the PESU program, please go to the PESU National Classroom. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Chris Wyant, our speaker today. <clears throat> the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health, EPA Region 6 <laughs> Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, is very pleased to be joined by Dr. Chris Wyant. Dr. Chris Wyant retired in April 2020 as the founding president and CEO of the Caring for Cholera Colorado Foundation. Caring for Colorado is a conversion foundation endowed with the proceeds of the 1999 sale of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Colorado to Anthem Insurance. By 2020, the foundation distributed more than $100 million in grants to improve health and health care in Colorado, which I appreciate because I grew up in Colorado. But prior to joining the foundation, Dr. Wyant was the executive director of the Tri-County Health Department, serving the residents in Adams, Arapahoe, and Douglas counties in metropolitan and rural Colorado. For 13 years, he served as the deputy director at Tri-County and the director of environmental health. Prior to coming to Colorado, Dr. Wyant worked for the Illinois Department of Public Health, where he was responsible for a variety of programs addressing the human health effects of exposure to toxic substances in the environment. Dr. Wyant has been involved for many years in issues of national, state, and local public health and environmental policy. He was also an adjunct instructor for Texas Instructor for Texas A&M University through Texas Engineering and Extension and the National Emergency Response and Rescue Training Center. Currently, Dr. Wyant serves on an ad hoc committee of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to study the human health effects of per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. Again, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Wyant with us today. And on behalf of the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health, we would like to offer him a warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Wyant. Thank you. Glad to be here with you. Let me uh, share the screen here and we'll get started. I appreciate the opportunity. I think this opportunity will, I hope, give you not only a sense of this notion of forever chemicals that have certainly been in the news lately and will continue to be for some time, but also it's such a typical scenario. In my now 50 years in the public health business, it seems like uh, many 
chemicals have gone through this the same general process. You can talk about lead, PCBs, disinfection byproducts, you name it. A number of chemicals that, that really have followed kind of the same scenario and how we've learned how to study the chemicals, how to regulate them, and eventually how to protect human health and the environment. So PFAS is, is just one of those, and it's a particularly challenging one, as we'll learn, because of the, the fact that it's a ubiquitous chemical, and it is called a forever chemical for a reason. So let's get to it. So today we'll talk about what forever chemicals are. We'll talk about where they're found and how humans are exposed, the health effects that we know of associated with, with exposure to those chemicals, uh, whether or not they're regulated, and, and if so, what that means. For those of you who are clinicians, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a physician. Position, but I'll, I will tell you what I know about how to talk to your patients. It won't be advice on, on what tests to run or, or what medical advice to give them, but it's really how you as a clinician or you as a local public health uh, person or, or you uh, somewhere in the healthcare system can appreciate uh, what individuals and communities are going through and, and what some of the challenges are that they'll be faced with and that you'll be faced with trying to provide good information to uh, clients. And then more broadly, kind of back to this business of the, the scenario we're talking of here that's been repeated a number of times over here, uh, over time, is what are the public health challenges, what we don't know about these chemicals and their effects, and how we can go about learning more. So we're talking about PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, uh, commonly referred to as PFAS, and, and I'll caution you to be cautious how you use that term. So PFAS with an A refers to the collection of substances, uh, the, the group of substances. Substances. Soon we'll see PFAS, PFAS with an O that refers to one particular PFAS chemical. So it, it might get confusing. A couple of examples of PFAS chemicals, perfluorocarboxylic acids, which include perfluorooctanoic acid, also known as PFOA, uh, which is one of the more commonly tested and monitored chemicals. Another, perfluorohexane sulfonic acid, PFHXS. However, well, for those of you who enjoyed your organic chemistry class back in college, uh, I'll show you a couple structures and you can see from that uh, some of this concern about persistence. You notice that the these particular ones, P4 and PFHXS, both long chain uh, carbon molecules uh, firmly bonded to number of fluorine atoms, and then the active group on the uh, on the end, either the sulfonic acid uh, or the octanoic acid on the end of the molecule. The problem is there are more than just these couple. There are over 5,000 different PFAS chemicals. Some are long chain, some are short chain. They all have some similar qualities, but they all also differ. And the, a big problem is we really don't know much about very many of these 5,000 chemicals. We know about them as a class, but we really don't know about them individually, particularly as it relates to kinds of health effects may occur, what they do in the environment. The things that make PFAS chemicals really useful in commerce are the, the things that make them really dangerous in terms of exposure both to the environment and to humans. They're hydrophobic, lipophobic, and that makes them resistant to grease, oil, and water, yet they're persistent and bioaccumulative. They've, they've got some great products in, in terms of, or great aspects in terms of, uh, they're good for putting out uh, fuel fires on burning airplanes, for protecting upholstery from stains, and protecting you from grease uh, generating or penetrating your pizza box, and eggs from sticking to your pan. Uh, but at the same time, they bind with tissue protein and accumulate in the blood, the liver, the kidneys, and the brain. These chemicals are different from the from other halogenated chemicals we know, like PCBs or pesticides. DDT, for example, uh, because those tend to accumulate in the fat, whereas these, as I said, accumulate in the blood, liver, kidney, and brain. So it creates kind of a different situation. The half-life of these PFAS chemicals range from a tenth of a year to 35 years. So that presents another, uh, another issue that uh, once you're exposed and once they make their way into the tissue, uh, they may be there for some time to come. And we don't know a lot about what happens then in terms of 
is that if you've you've had if the half life is a tenth of a year, does it cause one series of human health effects? And if it's 35 years, do you have another issue? And, and the problem with the long half life is uh, when you go back and try to figure out cause and effect, you don't really know. It's difficult to find what the exposure source was or the the dose that was from that particular source because a lot may have happened in 35 years in terms of people moving around, being exposed to different drinking water sources, for example, different occupational sources. So it, it really adds an element of challenge to to try to figure out how to, to address these chemicals in humans. As a result of this persistence and the characteristics of PFAS chemicals, they're widely dispersed in the environment because once they get there, they tend to stay there. They're difficult to break down. Uh, and so they continue to persist over a long period. And while we don't know everything about these chemicals, we know they have been associated with health effects through animal and human studies. And we'll talk lots more about that as we go. Just to give you a little bit of a history timeline, uh, PFAS chemicals were first synthesized back between the 30s and the 50s. Uh, so we've known of these chemicals for a long time. It was in 1968 when evidence of PFAS was found in human serum, a serum where that was first observed. And as an example of what I, I mentioned earlier, that a lot of these chemicals come into the market, become prevalent, but it's a lot of years before we really know enough to do much about it. In the 80s, there were some preliminary toxicity tests on rodents that suggested some potential health effects. In 1999 was the first NHANES uh, survey with, of PFAS chemicals that we'll talk about briefly about later. They detected PFAS in 98% of the serum samples collected from the general population. It wasn't until 2005 that as a result of of a lawsuit that we'll also discuss that what was called the C8 panel began to look at human health data and, and human health outcomes. So you can see it's already been 50 some years from discovery to when it really began to look at impact on human health. And then in 2006 began the phase out of at least PFOA, one of the PFAS chemicals and other related compounds trying to go from the longer chain to the shorter chain uh, chemicals, presuming that, that they would be safer and the, the long chain chemicals. So it uh, it was a long period of time, and and imagine the exposure that took place. As we'll learn from the uh, from the one case study of the led to a lawsuit. Uh, these chemicals were discharged in the environment for a considerable amount of time, and there was a fair amount of exposure that likely took place over that time. Where are PFAS found? You know, here the term ubiquitous really does come to mind. It's certainly in the manufacturing industry where these products are made. So the raw material. Is is turned into the products like Teflon, aqueous film forming foam, uh, a mouthful, AFFF is the easy way to say it, used for firefighting, particularly uh, around airports and military bases, food packaging, personal care products, construction materials, cookware products, textiles, upholstery, carpet, and while it's not, it's discharged in the environment, it's not put in drinking water and fish on purpose, but by being discharged in the environment, that means it's typically also found in drinking water and groundwater and in contaminated fish that are uh, intended for consumption. So everywhere you go, uh, there's PFAS materials. And so it's no wonder that the NHANES study found that 98% of the population probably has PFAS in their blood. This uh, illustration I find useful because it really kind of brings home this notion that it's everywhere and you can't avoid it. And I, th I think it's useful to look at from the standpoint, again, of other chemicals that we've learned about in the past and that the same scenario uh, really takes place. So if you can see my arrow here, you go up to the upper right-hand corner, manufacturing site uh, was really kind of the beginning of closure. This particular site, the case study in West Virginia, uh, discharged their waste into the river. And that was back before there or any Clean Water Act regulations that may have managed or controlled that. Uh, that river became a drinking water source for, for animals. So animals then could consume PFAS contaminated water. And in a lot of cases, it may be pretty highly concentrated. Yet the, you look at, at the farm and so you then get sludge byproducts that come from down here at the wastewater treatment plant that's applied on agricultural land. Uh, so again, crops and or animals are, are contaminated. In the case of airports, 
you've got uh, both training and actual firefighting that goes on, uh, as well as the fact that even the turnout gear that the firefighters wear uh, impregnated with PFAS chemicals. So here again, there certainly are cases of known cases of, of PFAS contamination from this uh, military base or airport scenario that have gotten into the groundwater. And so from the groundwater, that often can become a public drinking water system. So it gets into the drinking water, may or may not be filtered out or, or removed depending on the treatment process used at that particular plant. In rural areas, you've got private wells. People have been, the private wells are contaminated and there's there's more uh, human exposure there. And again, in, in a residential area, so you're back now to the consumer products and the number of products, uh, virtually everything in the home may have been manufactured with some PFAS material. It's not like some uh, environmental contaminants where you've got a single source and you can track that single source and you can eliminate it and, and know the problems resolved. Uh, instead, in the case like this, you've got multiple sources and really uncontrollable discharge in various ways into the, the environmental system and or into the domestic home. And, and so no matter where you go, you're going to be exposed to some level or another. The Environmental Working Group in 2021 reported on some testing they had done to get an idea of the extent of PFAS contamination in water. And so you see on this uh, map, uh, the drinking water sites are blue, the military sites are purple, and then there are other known sites. And you can see where some states like North Carolina, there's been a lot of work because again, they're, they're known sources of exposure. Here's the, the area in West Virginia where the water has been contaminated by the DuPont plant that we'll, we'll talk more specifically about. Interestingly, there was a report put out this week in Colorado that, that talked about uh, PFAS in fracking fluid. And as you may know, fracking fluid being used for gas extraction is injected into the earth and it's injected at a fairly deep level, but there's groundwater between the surface and, and that level. And so there can be contamination. And if you look at this little hump here, that's basically Interstate 70 that goes uh, from Denver to Grand Junction. And right along that interstate uh, is some of the highest volume gas extraction in the state of Colorado. And so these drinking water supplies uh, are some of those that have been contaminated. And whether it's all from frack fracking fluid or not is, is unknown, but the fact is there's that at least geographic relationship. So you can see in their testing, they identified over 2,300 sites in 49 states where groundwater was contaminated or where water was contaminated. And in many, most of those cases, it was actually drinking water supplies where they discovered that contamination. Human exposure uh, really is it's like most environmental contaminants we run into or most uh, consumer product contaminants we run into. But there are a couple things about childhood exposure that are unique. Uh, we do know that PFAS chemicals can be transported through the placenta. We know that it, it's found in breast milk. We know the consumption of contaminated drinking water, including formula preparation. So if you say, well, gee, I may have PFAS in my breast milk, so I'm going to use formula. But if the drinking water supply is contaminated, then you've also exposed the child through the formula preparation. Typical hand-to-mouth behavior and surfaces that have been either treated with PFAS-containing products or in some cases have, have arrived through the environment. For instance, the pot plant that we've talked about uh, was found to emit a considerable amount of of dust into the air, which then was transported into homes. And so the inhalation of dust, as well as the, the contact, uh, hand to mouth contact with dust in the home. Uh, again, not unlike many of the other chemicals that we know of, lead certainly, for instance, is a good example of one where hand to mouth contact uh, with children is a significant problem. There's nothing really unusual here in terms of how kids get exposed, but it's clear that in their environment, it's pretty easy to be exposed to some level of PFAS chemicals. So I mentioned in Haynes, and so you asked the question, how do we know anything about who's been exposed and how they've been exposed? If you're not familiar with the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in Haynes, I, I won't assume everybody is, but it's fairly prevalent information. So hopefully you run across it. It's a nationally representative sample. Uh, they sample about 5,000 individuals per year. Uh, and I might say it's individuals over 12 years of age. So from this sampling, we don't have a lot of good information on young children. 
development in terms of body burden. And Haynes measures various health or takes various health and nutrition measurements. The results are intended to determine the prevalence of major diseases and risk factors for disease. Once again, an example here from us is it was blood lead sampling back in the 70s that began to identify the fact that a lot of children were exposed to, a lot of people were exposed to lead through different sources. It was that sampling data that really led to the attention to lead as an environmental contaminant, human uh, contaminant, and ultimately led to the decline of blood lead levels by uh, more than 70% by 1970. And that had to do with banning lead paint, uh, banning lead and gasoline, and so on. So it's, and Haynes really has turned out to be an excellent system to help identify what potential risks are out there in terms of exposure to environmental chemicals. A PFAS has been analyzed through NHANES beginning in the 1999-2000 sampling period. They they measured four different PFAS chemicals, and that's where uh, the data now shows that greater than 99% of NHANES participants have measurable levels of PFAS in their blood. And since this is a representative sample, the, the extension from that is is that we basically all uh, have been exposed to and have some level of PFAS uh, in our system. Although the good news, if there's good news, it's that background levels in the general population have been, been declining over time. And this gives you just a, a visual cue of that from uh, some work that was done in Minnesota where they measured, over time, they measured the reduction in uh, blood, blood, or blood uh, PFAS levels uh, between 2000 and 2014. To give you some quantitative perspective, you can see here from 2011 through uh, 2017, 18, the, the four chemicals that they measured, and it gives you a geometric mean in the 50th and 95th percentile that gives a sense of that order of magnitude in parts per billion of in serum of PFAS that have been identified. So it's generally in the single digit range as far as the kind of the, the mean. Sort of back to the half-life, again, of the four prominent PFAS chemicals, they range from a tenth of a year to uh, 35 years. And even within a certain, within any one of these chemicals, you see ranges from 2 to 10, 3 to 27, 4 to 35. So even within a particular uh, chemical, the, the half-life varies. And I'm not sure it's, they told they sorted out why the differences in measured half-life, but uh, it's one of the, the dilemmas that still sits out there is to, to try to figure out just exactly what that's about and, and how that impacts the, the risk of exposure to these chemicals. So far, we know that PFAS chemicals are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're accumulative and persistent, another kind of bad sign. Uh, not all exposures are to background levels of PFAS. So if you take the NHANES and say you've got a patient who you're not sure if they've been exposed, you can't make assumptions that, well, they, they probably just have a background level of, of PFAS that there are situations that, that we've now discovered around the country where there are significant levels of chemical in uh, in humans. And so, so there are some some significant exposures really need to be addressed. And, and that's where individuals and communities have become increasingly concerned. You know, one of the things that I've discovered over or that I've observed over my uh, tenure in the public health business is how back in the 1970s, communities and individuals really didn't pay much attention to the details of things like chemical exposure. Eventually, things like Superfund came around and, and communities began to, to be increasingly concerned. Uh, kind of with each uh, with each decade, with each era, communities became more and more involved in studying for themselves what some of these effects might be, not always necessarily believing that those who came from the government said, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help and, and I've got uh, expertise and don't worry, I'll take care of you. So communities really took more of a proactive role and that's really what What's happened with PFAS. I'll talk a little later about this committee I'm serving on that did some community meetings that gathered public input. And it was quite impressive how astute and how aware uh, communities were about uh, these chemicals and the, the potential effects and the research that's been done. There has now been research that has concluded that there are probable links between PFAS exposure and disease. And, and I put probable in quotes because that's that will relate to a specific uh, group that was charged with looking at those uh, connections. So let's talk a little about the kind of the case that, that has really brought this to the public's attention. 
over time. So in 1961, the DuPont scientists at what was called the Washington Works in Parkersburg, West Virginia, which is right along the southeastern border of Ohio and the northwestern border of West Virginia, the DuPont scientists recognized that PFAS chemicals cause liver enlargement in rats. In 1978, they recognized that employees at the plant had high rates of abnormal liver function. Uh, in 1982, the medical director determined all practical steps should be taken to reduce exposure to PFAS chemicals. So there you can already see 21 years from the first recognition of liver enlargement in rats to where the medical staff said, we probably need to do something about this. Now you can draw your own conclusions about uh, whether or not DuPont was, was hiding information or they didn't want to share or how they were dealing with this. The, there was certainly a major lawsuit that, that thought that DuPont was uh, disingenuous in their, their efforts. But nonetheless, it was still 21 years before even in-house they recognized there might be a problem. By 2003, two and a half million pounds of PFAS had been dumped by the facility. And in terms of the sludge that was a part of that component, there were 7,100 tons of sludge that were, there was also direct discharge into the river and downstream they began to see considerable effects in the animals uh, population as well as the, they began to see human disease clusters that didn't make sense and there was concern that was all coming from something from this plant and at the time they weren't really certain what it was. So in the early 2000s uh, there was a significant lawsuit filed uh, which wasn't settled till 2017 but in 2005 there was created through that lawsuit there was created uh, something called the C8 panel. C8 was because because PFOA, which was the chemical of interest at this point, happened to have eight carbon atoms, so they called it the C8 panel. And the C8 panel's job was to uh, really look at this probable link between PFOA exposure and human disease. So it was really the first time there was a, an outside group in this particular case that began to, to try to systematically put together information uh, to sort out, so what's the real risk associated with PFAS exposure? Uh, so between 2005 and 2013, this panel carried out exposure and health studies, uh, both uh, monitoring as well as epidemiologic studies in the Mid-Ohio Valley in several communities that were downstream from this plant that had been potentially affected by this PFOA release or these releases that had been emitted since 1950, the 50s. And this panel determined that they found a probable link and they defined probable link as establishes general causation and is more likely than not that there is a link between exposure and a particular disease. Specifically, they found uh, this probable link with hypercholesterol Oolemia, thyroid disease, both hypo and hyperthyroidism, ulcerative colitis, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, pregnancy induced tension. And below here is a link that links to the some more specifics about what they discovered. So this, as far as I know, is really kind of the first really visible systematic study that was accomplished. So from this, so now we know there's some probable relationship with, with diseases. So it, it, the challenge has been, how do you address this with not just patients, but people in the community that think they may have been exposed Back to the general scenario, there's not enough information to be definitive to say, if you are exposed to this quantity, you will see this disease or this outcome. But at the same time, you know that this probable link means that if you're exposed, chances are good that over some period of time and some level of exposure, you're going to see some kind of effect. And at least in those areas that I just described. So what's the discussion has been is how do you how do you really work whether you're a public health uh, person whether you're a local physician whether you're somewhere else in the healthcare system you know maybe you're an elected official how do you really work with the community to try to address the concerns that they have and one of the things we found is that there's not much information out there in a lot of cases that our people don't pursue that information is there. So it's recommended to learn about potential exposure in a community. There's a difference between if you're in you know, rural Colorado and you're miles from any kind of military base or any kind of airport or any kind of manufacturing plant and there are no known sources of potential PFAS exposure, that's important information. If you happen to live in Colorado Springs, just upstream in terms of the groundwater from from the military base that sort of gives you a different perspective and you you may handle things in a in a slightly different way
it's important to recognize that individuals and groups that are in potentially exposed communities have done their homework. They know where these sources are. They may see clusters of disease in, in their view, which may or may not be statistically significant or, or scientifically plausible in terms of are they really the same disease, but they, they've got enough information to, to raise the question and pursue that with a healthcare community saying, what can you do to help me here? A discussion of exposure history, health effects, and potential testing. There is blood testing available in, in the U.S. for uh, certain PFAS chemicals. Whether everybody needs a blood test is, is not really determined, but based on exposure history and health effects, it's really just kind of standard protocol to decide what, if any, testing or monitoring might be useful as a result. There are recommendations for reducing exposure. I'll go over some of those in just a minute. And in general, the, the advice through CDC, ATSDR, those who have, have done the work and put out the guidance so far say follow current standards of care based on the findings because you're not likely to, to see the smoking gun where you've been exposed today and tomorrow uh, you, you suddenly have come down with a disease that you know you can attribute to PFAS because as you re as you look back in those diseases, those are there are some that are are rarer than others. But hypertension during pregnancy or thyroid issues aren't necessarily only caused by PFAS, and therefore you can't make that direct connection. Uh, so if if you find if your findings are such that there there's follow up that's needed, it's the current standards of care that really should be followed in order to address the patient. And of course, always promote age appropriate preventive care. So it doesn't seem very satisfying that those are the answers, but that's the problem with, with many environmental chemical exposures is you don't have enough information to be very definitive unless you're dealing with something like mesothelioma, which is essentially always caused by asbestos exposure. You really don't have that smoking gun that says, if you've got this disease, you know it's because of this exposure. And so it, it becomes a real challenge because the patient isn't all that satisfied if you can say, well, I don't really know what's causing this, and I can't tell you for sure that it's your PFAS exposure. Some of the recommendations about what to do in your personal life to avoid or, or to address exposure Closure. Often not all that feasible and practical because these chemicals are involved in virtually all the products or in a lot of products that you'll find in the home. So you can avoid stain resistant carpet and upholstery and avoid products with PTFE, that's basically Teflon. Talks about cookware, filtering your water, which I'll have a little more to say about. Avoid microwave popcorn because of the concern of the chemicals that get into the food product itself. And then as far as the community, once again, help retailers and manufacturers who want products made without PFAS. That's a challenging thing to do. Urge your local utility to test for PFAS if you think that there has been a potential exposure. So if there is a manufacturing plant upriver, the water utility may have already done that testing. And there are certain things that local utilities are required to report. So that kind of follow-up may make some sense. Whether or not you set up a statewide blood testing program really depends on if there's actually been a an identified source. So you can see there, there are a lot of things you can do and whether or not they get done will depend on kind of what the risk is determined to be, whether or not there's a point source of exposure or, or a general concern about PFAS exposure in the community. Specifically related to drinking water, if there is concern, there are two types of, of drinking water systems that can be what they call point of use devices that you can literally attach to your your own uh, individual water supply. Uh, those are certified by a group called NSF International to remove certain PFAS chemicals. Uh, there's a, in the references, there will be a link to uh, to that NSF certification. So that can, can provide some peace of mind. Again, baby formula mixed with non-PFAS contaminated water. Local fish advisories is another way that some states have addressed the potential of contamination that gets into the lake. And if they're particularly subsistence fisher people that take fish out of the lake and consume it, that there may be advisories on quantities of fish that are safe to consume. But this also brings up the notion of regulatory remedies and the problem that the reason we don't have regulations is because we don't have adequate information to create regulations. So that again gets back to this big unknown. I know there may be a problem, but I don't know what I can 
can do to, to resolve it because we don't have adequate data to support the development of, of say, drinking water standards. EPA has created, a, or US EPA has created a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion in water. Uh, one of the things we've discovered is often that 70 parts per trillion gets misinterpreted uh, to be 70 parts per trillion in humans in blood. This is 70 parts per trillion in water. The problem with EPA health advisory is that it's not regulatory. It has no compliance uh, to it. It has no regulatory muscle so that nobody's required to reduce their drinking water to that level or below that level. But it creates confusion because people will say, well, if you've got a health advisory and you set it 70 parts per trillion, why isn't that a standard or why isn't the standard lower? But to create a maximum contaminant level standard, MCL, under the Safe Drinking Water Act requires a whole different level of proof in order to create a regulation that will withstand the scrutiny it needs to to become an actual enforceable limit. What we have learned is a number of states have taken it upon themselves to regulate PFAS chemicals. There's also a link in the, the references to a report by the Environmental Council of States that goes state by state and talks about those, uh, those levels, it says that I've got a bandwidth problem here. And so you can you can read about state regulations. So there have been some states that have taken it upon themselves to do that. Uh, this just shows, again, uh, from a, a Minnesota study, it shows the reduction of, of PFAS in blood as a result of uh, filtering water. So it just does prove that these water filtration systems do work. So kind of going back to the beginning where I said that this is one of those, one of many chemicals that have come along where it becomes a real public health challenge. How do you gather the right information in a timely manner to make decisions that are protective of public health and the environment. And what are the things that keep you from doing that? Uh, in this case, we've got growing concern as P class contamination is identified in more communities. Uh, we've identified a number of environmental justice issues with PFAS, like we have a lot of other chemicals in terms of, of how marginalized communities may be more at risk uh, because of their proximity to some of those sources, for example. we've There's an absence of comprehensive monitoring data, so we don't really have a good picture. We've got this NHANES, which gives us a big picture, but not necessarily a comprehensive picture of PFAS contamination and levels in humans. We've got the persistence in the environment, and as, as I mentioned, Mentioned earlier, the challenge of tracking sources of exposure over time. We've got, in the case of PFAS, of these 5,000 plus chemicals, we've got unknown mixtures, and we don't know much about their chemical or their toxicological characteristics. We still really have a lack of health effects research to determine health risk. I'll speak to that again in a moment. And as I mentioned, an absence of science to support rulemaking. So you really can't be definitive and say, we know that above this level is a problem, below this level is safe, which means there's too much uncertainty, too few facts. So when, when you do try to make judgments, you have to address all the uncertainty that goes along with it. If you're actually doing risk assessment, you do that in terms of safety factors. If you're just trying to provide support for the community, you do it in terms of just acknowledging, here's the data I have, but I can't be really certain what that means. There are new PFAS chemicals are being developed, presumably trying to develop safer chemicals that still do what they need to do, but we don't know any more about those than we knew about these in the 1950s. The inability to interpret results. So let's assume you get a blood sample and your blood sample is two times what the NHANES average is. What does that mean? Does, is that a great risk, a small risk? We really don't know. If it's 10 times, what does that mean? Again, the educated public. Uh, so there are more demands. There, there are more individuals out there who are saying, I know something about this and I know there's some risk and I need to have answers. And, and I'm coming to you, elected officials or health agencies or physicians or clinics to give me information. And then the lack of information for clinicians, a lot of times you just have to say, I really don't know. In some cases, it's, I really don't know what PFAS chemicals are. In other cases, it's, here's all the information, but I don't know what it means because it hasn't really been interpreted. So who's doing what? Well, CDC and ATSDR are certainly involved in the process. ATSDR has done a fair amount of work in trying to gather information about PFAS in terms of its occurrence, in terms of its toxicity, and 
So uh, the US EPA uh, has a plan that presumably is going to result in things like a drinking water MCL under the Safe Drinking Water Act. National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is sponsoring a lot of research in a variety of communities. State and local health departments are involved. I just happened to notice in some of my research that Texas Tech in Lubbock is, is doing some work in terms of land applied biosolids. And I'm sure there's probably some other human health work going on there I'm not aware of, but a number of universities are doing uh, work in that area. And the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine are working on a report that I'll describe to you in a moment. Here's uh, the, the logos, the names of some of the organizations. Uh, Northeastern University Social Science and Environmental Health Research Institute has really gathered a lot of information and has got a fair amount of expertise in the topic Silent Spring Institute, Michigan State. There are programs in all these areas that, that really is contemporary as information is available in terms of being able to work with communities that they know have been exposed and trying to help them sort out what that means. So I mentioned uh, last year that the National Academy of Science Committee, ATSDR contracted with the National Academy to, to really kind of stop at this point in time and say, we'd like you to gather all the information you can gather and take a look at the research and assess the strength of evidence of putative health effects of PFAS chemicals, develop some general principles for clinical evaluation that are specific to PFAS chemicals, review the current knowledge about the contribution of exposure sources, and advise whether changes to current clinical guidance on PFAS or blood and urine testing are needed. So as I said, this group is representative of a variety of experts around the country. There has been a number of public meetings to gather information from communities that have specific PFAS-related exposure issues. A lot of experts have come to the table to present the results of their work, considerable literature searching to see what's actually out there. And in the next several months, this committee will issue a report that I would urge you to keep an eye out for if this is a topic you're really interested in, because it's not going to give all the answers. But what I think it will represent is a point in time look at, so where are we now? Let's gather all the information we can and make a determination of where we are now in terms of this topic and with some guidance on, so where do we need to go from here? So I think you'll find this report when it comes out will be uh, quite helpful to get us additional information on where we stand with PFAS. And this, uh, I understand this PDF of these slides will be available, so I won't dwell on the references, but a number of references that can point you to information that supports what I've said here and gives you some more direction in terms of other places you can go to find information. So with that, I think we still have a few minutes left here. Marama, I, I think you uh, take charge now. Thank you so much, Dr. Wyman, for that presentation. And folks, yes, if you've got any questions, please, in your chat or in the Q&A, please go ahead and feel free and, and ask your questions and we will get those answered. And uh, Dr. Wyatt has graciously agreed to allow us to provide you all with a PDF version of his slides. I do have a question that came in that says, does PFAS accumulate in the liver since rats and people get abnormal liver function? PFAS does accumulate in the liver. I can't give you specifics on quantities or how it may be impacted by other exposures, but it, but it is known that it accumulates in the liver. Great, thank you. Another question, is it known if PFAS causes hormonal disruption? It's my understanding is it certainly is speculated, but there aren't a lot of details that I've seen of exactly what that means. But it, it's speculated that hormone interaction, immune system interaction, that those are involved with PFAS exposure. I, I really can't give you any more details because there's just not a lot of specific literature that says what, what specifically happens. Great, thank you. All right, I don't see any other questions. Dr. Wyatt, thank you so much for your time and providing this presentation. It's a lot of information. We greatly appreciate it. And for everyone who uh, joined us. Thank you so much for taking that time out. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, participating. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.